Okay, well, welcome everybody to this uh, panel on the French election. I'm Sophie Meunier, the co-director of the EU program at Princeton. And we thought this would be a practically opportune time to try to um, shed a little bit of light on what's going on. We're not going to be making too many predictions about what's going to happen on Sunday, even though this is exactly what we were doing right now. Uh, <laughs> but let me remind you that this is a, um, a pretty busy week for French politics. The first round of the French presidential election was on the 22nd of April. And the second round is going to be this Sunday, actually, for those of you who are French and live in Princeton, it's this Saturday, because we are voting, we have a polling station in Princeton, we're voting all day Saturday, so this is a little community service announcement. Uh, but the results will not be divulged until Sunday, and by 2 p.m. U.S. time on Sunday, you will know who the next French president is for the next five years. And actually, uh, we will be broadcasting the results live, hopefully, if everything works out and if Florent can manage to get the thing to work. Um, Dodds will be open, the Dodds um, auditorium upstairs from 1.30 p.m. on until about 3.30. So we can all come and watch together and, you know, cry or laugh or applaud or whatever uh, together on Sunday. So you, everybody's welcome uh, to... Join, uh, to join in the fun. Um, but as I say, it's been a, a pretty busy week. Uh, over the weekend, insults have been flying left and right. Um, old ghosts came back, like uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn and the specter of Gaddafi. Uh, today is Labor Day, is, uh, you know, first of May in France, which is a, a, a big day, a uh, day off from work, and also a day traditionally of uh, de big demonstrations. So this year we actually had three competing demonstrations going on. Um, one is, as usual, the trade unions, the labor unions, who um, demonstrate this year. They were all uh, united, demonstrated together. Um, then for the past, for, for a while now, the National Front has been staging its own May 1st demonstration, um, Joan of Arc, Pri Proud France uh, demonstration. And this year we had the third one, which was orchestrated by President Nicolas Sarkozy, um, he said this would be the um, a day for real, uh, uh, for real labor or real labor day or something. I mean, nobody really understood what he meant and a lot of people found this was offensive, but he managed to get quite a lot of people out in the Trocadero. We can't tell you how many people were there because the numbers are extremely disputed. Some people said 200,000, some people said 20,000. Uh, but it was a big day for being outside in the street in France today. And tomorrow is actually the presidential debate. We only have one, and it's tomorrow. It's going to last for two hours. The two candidates are going to face off uh, each other around the table for two straight hours. So that will be pretty interesting too. Um, so, you know, it's time for the French to make some choices. I just brought you what I got in the mail yesterday, uh, which is the campaign posters for the two candidates. So we have Nicolas Sarkozy, who's the incumbent president, conservative uh, president of the UMP party, and this is François Hollande, the socialist uh, candidate. And before I introduce our distinguished panelists and, and we move on with the program, I just wanted to show you, I hope it works, the two campaign clips for um, going into the second round. I mean, in France, we don't have political ads on TV. They're forbidden by law. But the candidates are allowed to make a campaign ad, which is shown in equal time uh, on, on TV. So these are the two uh, ads. I'll try to translate this. Nicolas Sarkozy est vraiment le président qui est capable et qui est en mesure de rassembler okay, tous les Français, toutes les origines, get de toutes les catégories socioprofessionnelles. Il est capable de diriger la France. Il peut aller en France. Ce n'est pas uniquement au niveau de la France, mais aussi au niveau de l'Europe. Quelqu'un qui ne se laisse pas faire, c'est quelqu'un qui avance. 
Il a en plus euh, pu acquérir une expérience d'homme d'État depuis 5 ans. Je pense que ces 5 dernières années vont lui bénéficier pour les 5 prochaines années. Justement de réaliser des réformes euh, comme la réforme des retraites. Je suis pour Nicolas Sarkozy parce qu'il parle juste. Juste. En <rire> de la vanité. Ça fait pas toujours plaisir, mais ça fait toujours du bien. Strong, a strong France, Mes chers compatriotes, j'ai choisi d'entendre, d'écouter okay. ce que vous nous avez dit, à nous, tous les candidats, uh -huh. au premier tour. So C'est que l'Europe ne peut plus continuer à être une Europe passoire. C'est que l'Europe ne peut pas Que l'Europe doit vous protéger. Que l'Europe doit vous défendre. Defend. Que l'Europe doit être au service de la protection de notre yeah. civilisation. Si dans un an les méthodes de l'Europe n'ont pas changé, je suspendrai l'application de Schengen. Si nous avons décidé de gérer nos frontières c'est pour qu'elles soient mieux protégées. Je diviserai par deux le nombre d'étrangers accueillis sur notre territoire. Je ne le ferai pas pour dire que nous devons nous méfier des autres ou avoir peur de la différence. Je le fais parce que je vois en vérité que le système d'intégration à la française ne fonctionne plus. Il ne fonctionne plus parce anymore. que nous avons accueilli trop de monde. Nous exigeons many avant la fin de l'année, désormais, que toute personne qui veuille rejoindre la France soit obligée de passer un examen so now avant l'année, montrant qu'elle maîtrise le français exam, et qu'elle connaît les valeurs de la République. Au fond, pourquoi le candidat socialiste veut-il donner le droit de vote aux étrangers Si les étrangers vont voter alors qu'ils demandent à devenir français, le 6 mai, c'est un choix historique. La France n'a pas le droit à l'Europe. Le 6 mai, chaque vote va compter. Votre choix décidera de la direction que retiendra la France. Peuple de France, n'ayez pas peur. Si vous décidez que vous voulez gagner, aidez-moi, aidez la France. C'est ici, vive la République et vive la France. So we'll start with our dedicated historian, uh, David Bell, who's the Sydney and Ruth Lapidus professor in the era of North Atlantic revolutions in the history department at Princeton. Um, David is a historian of uh, early modern France. He's written many uh, very important books. And he's also helping to publicize uh, the understanding of French politics for an American audience. He writes in the popular media, most often in the New Republic. Um, then we'll move to Angèle Christin, who just arrived from Paris. She's an um, advanced doctoral <coughs> candidate at the uh, EHE2S, the Ecole uh, des Hautes Études uh, Supérieures, and she's visiting here uh, the LAPA. No, she's actually a PhD student here in sociology. Oh, she is? Oh, I thought you were first. Okay, sorry, joint PhD then. <laughs> okay, <laughs> in, in sociology. And she's working, she's writing her dissertation uh, mm -hmm. on the comparison of the, the role of the French and the American media. Uh, then, and she's going to talk about, about the media. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the lessons uh, from the electoral campaign, uh, what travels, what doesn't travel. And finally, we'll end uh, with Ezra Suleiman, who's the IBM Professor of International Studies in the Department of Politics here at Princeton and uh, director of the Center for French Studies. Um, in addition to the many, many books that Ezra has written, he's a very, very well-known analyst, American analyst in France, and he's also extremely well-connected with French politicians and know all the juicy gossip. So we'll hear what he has to say, and he's going to talk about whether there's any difference between Hollande and Sarkozy and what a Holland victory would mean for France. So uh, let's see if I can show you the second clip, and then we'll get going.
Mes chers concitoyens, c'est maintenant. Okay, c'est maintenant qu'il faut nous rassembler. C'est maintenant qu'il faut redresser la France. C'est maintenant qu'il faut retrouver confiance en nous. Et reprendre notre destin en main. C'est maintenant qu'il faut maîtriser la finance. La remettre au service de l'économie. Redonner sa valeur au travail, au mérite et à l'effort. C'est maintenant qu'il faut une république exemplaire. C'est maintenant qu'il faut combattre la corruption, no corruption mettre fin au no favoritisme, lutter contre no. les rémunérations indécentes. C'est maintenant qu'il faut aider nos entreprises, soutenir notre industrie, défendre notre agriculture, protéger notre environnement et encourager les énergies nouvelles. C'est maintenant qu'il faut retrouver le sens de ce qui est juste. Du partage équitable des efforts. C'est maintenant qu'il faut mettre fin aux privilèges. C'est maintenant qu'il faut rendre la priorité à l'école. Give priority back to education. La sécurité, l'accès à la santé, au logement. Health, Il faut donner housing, un grand élan à la culture, culture et à la recherche. C'est maintenant qu'il faut se tourner à nouveau vers l'avenir et redonner à la jeunesse toutes ses chances. C'est maintenant qu'il faut recréer de la solidarité entre les générations. C'est maintenant qu'il faut refuser une France divisée. C'est maintenant que nous avons le plus besoin de ce qui fait notre cohésion, notre force et notre fierté. La République. C'est maintenant qu'il faut nous rassembler pour réussir le changement. Mes chers concitoyens, le changement, c'est maintenant. It's terrific to be here. Um, while I'm primarily in my expertise as a historian of, of the French Revolution, I'm not going to go all the way back to that, although I am tempted to say that Mirabeau would be rolling over in his grave to see what we just saw, but that's, that's but I will not uh, pause on that. I, I do want to say I'm delighted to be here with, with Ezra because um, I first you know, encountered the serious study of French politics in his graduate seminar longer ago than either of us would like to admit. Um, and you know, a great, most of what I've learned, I think, about French politics, I learned from him. But I am just going to try to give a kind of <clears throat> more recent historical background to the election, particularly looking at Sarkozy and what his presidency has meant, and also ask a few questions about what a Hollande victory would probably mean um, for French politics. So I'm sure most of you have heard the, the, the delightful story about what the Chinese leader, Zhou Enlai, responded when asked what he thought about the French Revolution. He supposedly said, It's too early to tell. <laughs> well, I don't know. No, hold, hold on. I was recently crushed to, to read that apparently he wasn't actually talking about the French Revolution of 1789, but about May 1968, just a couple of years later. So another great historical bull mode down the drain, along with let them eat cake and many others. Too bad. Still, when I think that I think that when it comes to the French presidential election of 2012, it really is too early to tell. And this is not simply because, obviously, we are still in the middle of it. There are elections which, in a sense, ratify and confirm social and political changes which have already taken place. But then there are elections which are more the starting point for changes to come. And I think a lot of people have been treating 2012 as an election of the former variety because of the rise and also the so-called de-demonization of the National Front, which the first round results last Sunday seemed to ratify. But I think it's more likely to be seen as one of the latter, an election that in a sense breaks a mold and reshuffles the cards. Um, I know that um, now I know historians are notoriously bad at making predictions about the future, uh, but let me say while well, I'm still going to try to make a prediction about this year's race. And the reasons above all have to do with the state of Nicolas Sarkozy's party, the UMP. UMP. I know most observers treat it as a kind of moderate right-wing party, although I expect we'll be hearing a correction to this conventional wisdom from Ezra in a few minutes. Um, for a long time, this party has suffered from an identity crisis. I mean, just look at its name. Its name is the Union, in French, it's in, it translates as the Union for a Popular Movement, which is basically meaningless. Uh, it was previously known as the Union for a Presidential Majority. It descends from the Rally for the Republic, which succeeded the Union of Democrats for the Republic, which itself was previously known as the Union for the Defense of the Republic, the Union of Democrats for the Fifth Republic, and the Union for the New Republic, all of which trace their ancestry back to the Rally of the French People of Charles de Gaulle. Did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I think the, part, the reason the party has been implicated in so many financing scandals is that the changes of stationery have been so expensive. <laughs> But I would hold that under Nicolas Sarkozy, these problems of identity sort of reached an absurd new peak. I mean, in theory, this is 
the Gaullist party, or the neo-Gaullist party, if you will. But what, if anything, does this label mean today? I mean, Gaullism itself was always notoriously hard to define, but generally it was held to stand for a number of things. A politics of national grandeur, independent of any Eastern or Western bloc. Dirigisme, meaning a state direction, although not state control or ownership of the economy. A national unity, symbolized above all by a powerful chief executive. And also, I think, a degree of kind of bedrock social conservatism, what Richard Nixon would call the silent majority in the United States, but very distinct from the xenophobic reactionary conservatism that had flourished before the war and that the Nazis brought to power under Vichy. Um, now, over, over the years, certainly successive Gaullist leaders moved away from some of these positions. I think Chirac certainly took his distance um, from, these, from traditional Gaullism, particularly during his vaguely neoliberal phase under Mitterrand, uh, during his own government cohabitating with Mitterrand in 1986. Still, there have always been party leaders who have been more than eager to pledge their continuing fealty to the general, uh, Dominique de Villepin, for instance, at least until 2010 when he broke with the party, I think on June 18th, actually, symbolically, the date of General de Gaulle's appel to France in 1940. So anyway, Gaullism has been buried many times. I know this. Um, but I, now I really do think with Sarkozy that we need to throw the last handfuls of dirt on the coffin and walk away. Now remember that the Fifth Republic is now 54 years old. So 16 more years and it will hold the record of the longest lasting regime in French history since the Bourbon absolute monarchy came to an end in 1789. I mean, historians love this kind of thing. Um, the election of François Mitterrand, which was such a, a, a watershed in so many ways, now we have to say this happened during the first half of the history of the Fifth Republic. Um, so despite the long shadow cast by Charles de Gaulle, I don't think we can think of the Fifth Republic as essentially as a Gaullist Republic. It has gone on too long. It has changed too much. And of all the supposedly Gaullist politicians, it's Nicolas Sarkozy who really made the strongest break with Gaullist tradition. I mean, I think in some ways we could almost call him an anti-Gaullist. Um, Villepin would call him an anti-Gaullist. Um, in place of a politics of national grandeur, we have strong cooperation with the United States and a reversal of de Gaulle's decision to take France out of the unified NATO command. Um, we have a tight partnership with Germany, often tacitly accepting the role of junior partner. To the extent that France still retains something of a high-profile independent foreign policy, this role has centered less on national grandeur than on human rights and the responsibility to protect, as in Libya. Um, in domestic policy, there's at least been talk, if not necessarily all that much effective action, on a rupture with French social and economic traditions. And in place of a politics of national unity, we now have with Sarkozy, or have had, a politics of national identity, which is something quite different, if we saw the sort of underside of it just now in his campaign ad. Uh, so what does this all add up to? Now, I'll confess that five years ago, I thought Sarkozy might have actually managed, might be able to devise a new vision and program for a kind of new sort of French center-right party, a vision that would have centered on an embodiment of France, as, a, as and the concept of France as the embodiment of values of liberty and human dignity, possibly in the context of European unity, although there was that Mediterranean initiative, and that it might potentially have been inclusive and moderate, uh, capable of attracting votes from the center, and the center left. There were at least a few hopeful signs of this. There was the high flown campaign rhetoric. There was the eclectic and diverse cabinet he chose on first taking office with Bernard Kouchner, a socialist, with Rachida Dati, a woman of North African descent. There was even his early rhetoric about a politics of civilization, although that very much cuts two ways, as again we just saw in the campaign ad where he's posing as the defender of civilization, the new Charles Martel holding back the Arab hordes at the Loire. Um, but, and then there were the, the promise to develop new initiatives for integrating communities of immigrant descent. So there seemed at least a possibility that we might finally be able to stop talking about Gaulism and we could start talking about something new, Sarkozyisme. And it didn't happen. There is no real Sarkozyisme. I think the clear sign of this is that when you talk about a Sarkozyist in France today, you really mean somebody who supports Sarkozy. You don't mean somebody who follows a particular ideological line. There isn't really such a line. Obviously, Sarkozy himself doesn't deserve all the blame for this. The financial collapse, the unending agony of the Eurozone have so much of the responsibility. Sarkozy has spent much of his presidency in crisis mode, something which, he's, which his manic personality is well suited for. Um, 
He's also continuously undercut himself, thanks to his self-aggrandizement, his weak attention span, and his coarsely confrontational personal style. I would love to see a few decades from now a history book that tries to associate each president of the Fifth Republic with a single well-known phrase. With De Gaulle, we might have France cannot be France without grandeur. Pretty good. What, what do you think would be for Sarkozy? Casse-toi pauvre con. <laughs> what he said to a protester in early 2008, it roughly means shove off, asshole. <laughs> and, <clears throat> I mean, it is probably his best known saying, no? I mean, so, obviously these failings all contributed to Sarkozy's foreshowing in the first round of the elections a week ago. I'll vote for another one. Avec Carla, c'est du sérieux. Even better. With Carla, this is serious. Or, as he said about Obama, what did he say? You know, Obama may be black, but I, I've tanned. J'ai bruni. So, obviously these failings all contributed to his poor showing in the first round of the elections. But I think the real consequences are going to be felt later after he probably loses the second round to François Hollande. There is, of course, I think still a small chance he won't lose. He might have some secret dossier on Hollande that he's just itching to release, although it's getting very late. Um, but the polls show Hollande comfortably ahead. But what is going to happen if he wins? So we have a UMP party whose leader has moved it away from its Gaullist roots without really replacing these roots with anything else solid, without any really attractive vision or program. There's obviously a party apparatus. If Sarkozy does win, it will probably keep chugging along. It's always possible that a new leader could emerge, take charge of it, and keep things chugging on as before. But I do think, like a lot of other observers, that there is a, a chance, not a, not, a, not a certainty, but a chance that if Sarkozy loses badly this coming Sunday, the party could collapse or come close to, close to collapse. Then what happens? Well, then what happens is that unlike in earlier moments in the history of the Fifth <coughs> Republic, we now have a relatively unified, relatively dynamic party to the right of the UMP that could reap considerable benefits from its collapse. Obviously, one person who thinks this is Marine Le Pen, the leader of this party of the National Front. Just today, she confirmed that she is going to cast a blank ballot and was not going to give any indication to her followers as to how to vote in the second round. Obviously, she wants Sarkozy to lose. Obviously, she thinks she will gain the most from that. Um, and I do think she has managed fairly effectively in the eyes of much of French public opinion to de-demonize the National Front. A uh, few people think of her, unlike Dad, as an anti-Semite. She's positioned herself as a defender of French national interests against the bankers in Frankfurt, against the bureaucrats in Brussels, and against the burqa wearers in the streets of French cities. Not that anybody there is actually wearing a burqa, but it doesn't matter. Uh, she has done better than her father ever did in a presidential election. Yes, it is just 18%, barely a sixth of the electorate. But here's the question. I mean, the math can be very tricky here, and small percentages can matter a great deal. How much does the front, national front need in a badly divided political climate to reach major party status? Another 7%, another 6%, maybe not much more than that. What proportion of the UMP vote does it need? Let's imagine that in the wake of a collapse of the UMP, 20% of its, of its electors, 20% of its voters from the first round go and vote for the National Front, so just one fifth. And if they go vote in, the, in the, I'm saying in the legislative elections that will follow the presidential election. That's enough to put the front ahead of the UMP, possibly. Put it another way, if just 1.7 million voters switch from the UMP to the National Front, in the, from the first round, from the first round results, the Front becomes the second largest party in France after the Socialists. Is this likely? I'm not sure. Is it possible? Yes. And I think the most important poll I've seen in this respect is the one taken just after the first round, which showed that 64% of Sarkozy's voters favor an, some sort of legislative accord. It's not clear how formal but favor some sort of legislative accord with the National Front in the legislative elections. Is it entirely unlikely that just one third of these people might be tempted to vote National Front themselves? Again, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility at all. It depends on what happens in the wake, in the UMP, in the wake of the Sarkozy defeat. Um, no, again, it may not happen. It's not like the French socialists are without identity issues of their own. In fact, to take the reverse scenario from the one I'm discussing, if Hollande actually does lose, we might see a surge of support for the far left, even though Jean-Luc Mélenchon didn't do as well as some people thought in the first round. 
He was the candidate of the left front, this kind of new communist, if you want to call it that. I'm not sure what to call it. Um, but since Hollande is likely to win, the socialists probably will defer their own identity crisis in the interests of taking charge of the government. It's the collapse of the UMP and the consequent possible reshuffling of the French political deck, the rise of Le Pen, which I think is the real danger. I think for people who hope that, who hope that Hollande wins, and I would actually, although I'm not French, I would count myself in this category, this creates the disturbing possibility that the negative political consequences of his victory might actually outweigh the positive policy consequences of his victory. Again, I do think it is all up in the air. Um, <clears throat> and that's why, in the end, when it comes to the historical meaning of the 2012 election, I do really think it's too soon to tell. So thank you. and journalists insisted that you know, there is a democratic potential of the internet and that this potential would change the top-down habits of the French political system and journalistic field. So here I propose a brief assessment of the changes initiated by the internet. Um, I've drawn my own research at several news websites and um, in the data gathered at the seminar at the UHSS. And I find that actually results are mixed. So first, there is indeed a greater influence of the internet um, during uh, the presidential campaign. Um, so we've seen that uh, politics, for example, uh, politicians have been using Twitter quite um, assiduously and Facebook. So Jean-Luc Mélenchon, for example, um, is well known for tweeting uh, a I mean, several times a day and usually like 10 times a day. Um, we've also seen uh, Nadine Morano, who is um, uh, Minister of Apprenticeship, who's been tweeting regularly to um, mostly posting um, nasty comments about um, other presidential candidates. Um, and, you know, most of these candidates who have been, who have been relying on Twitter and Facebook usually emphasize that, you know, it was a way to communicate directly with the citizen, like to avoid to bypass the traditional media and they often emphasize the more democratic aspect of um, the internet. At the level of the media themselves, um, 
we've seen that uh, news websites became key actors in the coverage of the campaign. So in many media outlets, the print and the online newsroom have been joined together for the coverage of the election, most importantly at Le Monde, uh, where the two newsrooms have been put together, which has changed really the coverage of um, the election. And also a uh, pure play news website, meaning news websites with no print counterpart, have played an essential role during the campaign. So here I'm thinking of the Huffington Post with Anne Sinclair, uh, but also Mediapart, uh, well known for releasing several scoops about Sarkozy and the financing, I mean, the potential financing of the campaign by Gaddafi. So, you know, news websites became imp important actors in the campaign. Okay, so did that lead to a change in the style of the media coverage of the campaign? Um, well, to a certain extent, yes. I mean, we've seen more participatory forms of journalism um, that emerged. So web journalists usually love the word participatory, it's a bit of their, you know, their motto, but indeed, I mean, you know, for example, one of the main um, successes of the campaign was the boussole politique, started by two newspapers, Web France, uh, West France and 20 Minutes. Uh, so it was a political compass, a kind of test, where um, everyone could answer a couple of questions and then um, you would, like, the website would tell you for whom you should vote, depending on your answers. And this uh, test has been taken by two million visitors during the campaign. So, you know, quite a success. Okay, so, um, you know, first, first part of the answer, okay, so internet was more present in the coverage of the campaign. Um, it was more participatory and more grassroots to a certain extent. Okay, fine. <coughs> However, one would really be mistaken um, to think that the internet profoundly changed um, the campaign and the media coverage of the elections. Actually, the relative importance and influence of the internet during the campaign should not be, be overstated. I can take Twitter as an example. So, political figures use Twitter, it's true. But in fact, the number of followers that you know, keep track of uh, what uh, presidential candidates are doing on Twitter is very limited. So, Francois Hollande has the largest number of followers in France. How much do you think that is? Several million? No? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, 260,000 oh. followers. So, not that bad, but not that great either, right? I mean, and, like, you know, the media have been doing a big deal, I mean, you know, thinking that Twitter is really important, but in fact, it's still pretty limited. And actually, the most famous tweets and, like, kind of exchanges on Twitter have been uh, mostly diffused through traditional media, mostly newspapers and television. Same thing, you know, so, you know, news website <coughs> became important, but actually they didn't significantly change the rhythm of the campaign. Uh, and in fact, the most important events are still the television shows, um, you know, interviews and debates. With this election, for this time, a slight advantage for France 2, which is the public network, over TF1, uh, which is a one of the private networks, um, because, like, the the shows, the political shows on France 2 were actually more successful than the ones on TF1. So how do we explain that contrary to the predictions that were made, not so much has changed in the media coverage of the elections? Um, so I think that online media and the internet mostly reinforced already existing mechanisms that have been characterizing the media coverage of presidential elections in France for quite a long time. And I think that here um, we can draw on like, two concepts from the sociology of the media to get a better sense of the mechanisms at stake in the media coverage of this election. First important concept um, is that the media use frames. Uh, and by frames, sociologists usually mean small interpretative packages organized around a single idea, a simple idea, that is used to filter and organize the news for the audience. So during the elections, the media tend to alternate between two types of frames. The first kind of frames are technical frames, when the media covers the different programs of the candidates and <laughs> try to compare the programs like item by item. That's the first kind of frames. But the second, time of, the second kind of frames are more personalized frames, uh, usually focusing on the personalities of the candidates, their friendships or rivalries, and basically all the catfights, you know, and the race surrounding um, the campaign. 
So in French political theory, it's known as like the difference between le jeu, the game of the election, and les enjeux, the stakes of the election, right? So like the personalized frames talk more about the le jeu, the game, while um, the more technical frames talk more about les enjeux, the stakes. So what have we seen during this election? Well, as it has been mentioned before, mostly personalized frames, right? Um, that was very strong during the campaign. So like all the cat fights between the different candidates, uh, everything you know, ranging from Hollande seeing as a soft candidate, so he has, he has been called Flamby um, repeatedly during the media, so a kind of like soft, um, Put it, put it, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that kind of personal frames, you know, also Eva Jolie, the um, uh, environmental uh, candidate, was often presented as a foreigner who didn't really understand French culture and therefore could not really run as a candidate. Um, and similarly for Marine Le Pen, uh, where like the media really alternated between two types of frames uh, in order to present her. On the one hand, um, the frame showing that the idea of framing here as the inheritor of her father's idea of racist and anti-Semite ideology. And on the other hand, the idea that, no, in fact, Marine Le Pen is a normal candidate and should be treated like a normal candidate that is actually a victim of the prejudices of you know, the political and media system. So these frames have been even more prominent in online media. So the stories about the candidates' personal rivalries uh, usually get more hits online than um, you know, technical articles about um, what they actually talk about. So you know, if, you follow new, if, if you follow the news online, you'll see that you'll see a lot of articles about who is dressed how, who is fighting with whom, you know, what's that kind of uh, very personalized framing of the candidates. Um, second important concept that can be uh, useful to understand what's going on in the media coverage of the presidential election is the concept of mimetic behavior. Um, so, you know, one of the main features of the journalistic field is the competition between media outlets to get scoops, right? But also to define the rhythm of the media coverage. So, you know, who gets the scoop first? Who gets the news first? And who is the first one to release good news? <coughs> Um, so mimetic behaviors in the journalistic field are particularly strong during presidential campaigns because all of the media cover exactly the same topic, right? So the race between the different media outlets is even stronger during presidential campaigns. Um, and there is a desperate struggle between different media to take control of the rhythm of the campaign. So that's even stronger in, with online media, actually, because with content aggregation and real-time news, there is even more pressure to follow the circus, to follow the race, and to you know, move with the pack. Um, so when I attended editorial meetings at several news websites, uh, the journalists and editors all emphasized that they didn't want to be part of the pack, that they didn't want to um, be in the race for you know, having the latest news, and that they wanted to take more time to write their pieces. But in fact, it's impossible to resist the pressure. And this was particularly clear during the Toulouse tragedy and with the Mohamed Merah case, uh, when really like this terrible event occupied maybe 10 days uh, during the campaign. And during these 10 days, like all the media were covering you know, the arrest, I mean, the tra tracking the, um, the killer, like the arrest, the shooting, and everything. It was absolutely impossible for journalists not to talk about the Toulouse tragedy. So as a conclusion, um, yeah, so 2012 was really forecasted to be the year when the internet would drive the elections. And many people, mostly uh, politicians and journalists, but also normal people, voters, were hoping for a more grassroots and bottom-up approach to the presidential election. So like a change, ni nice change, you know, to the French system, which is usually like very centralized and very top-down. Um, but in fact, you know, the internet has really a limited influence, as I tried to show, and it was mostly business as usual, or I would say, as we say in French, tout change, mais rien ne change. Um, and so why is that so? I argue that it's mostly because online media didn't change the mechanisms guiding the media coverage of the election. It only reinforced existing routines, making it harder to change them. And to conclude, I will end with a question. So I mentioned that 
more personalized frames became more important uh, during the election and with online media. And so this trend towards a relative tabloidization um, of the media coverage of the election might have an interesting consequence, which is that the media tend to pay more attention to the private life of politicians. So, for example, there were several pieces about Valérie Trier-Veller um, with a journalist and also the partner of François Hollande. As you probably all know, it is not an exception in France since many politicians are actually married or live with journalists. It's a well-known, um, successful combination. And so, you know, you... <laughs> and, um, <laughs> well, you know, yes, the Strauss-Kahn and uh, Anne Sinclair, Montebourg and Audrey Boulevard, uh, Okrent and uh, Kushner. I mean, you know, we could, we, could, we could keep going. And so I found it interesting because, you know, so it's true that there is a trend in the media towards like a more personalized coverage, which is probably not such a great thing because usually it's not really critical. Um, still, it might challenge the norm, very prominent in France until the Strauss-Kahn case that private life is not a political matter to be covered by the media. And I will end here. So let me, um, what I want to do today is to talk about four lessons uh, that we can draw from the electoral campaign in France and from the results of the first rounds, both for French politics and maybe for American politics, maybe for other kinds of, of politics, I'm not sure. I want to uh, look at um, each four of them in turn and see if they are portable or not. So let me start with the first one, the shortest one, which is that what, one of the most surprising results last week was actually that the French turned out in droves to vote. We had um, a participation of about 80% in the first round which is even more surprising because it fell in the middle of a vacation for some people and a lot of people had said, well, the candidates are not very exciting. I mean, Sarkozy, you know, been there, done that. Hollande, not the most exciting candidate. So people were forecasting, analysts were forecasting much lower rate of participation. Uh, but that suggests that the French really wanted to send a message through the ballots and that they still believe in the power of, of democracy. And that the, this very morose uh, economic climate that we're experiencing um, in Europe has not left French citizens apathetic or feeling that they have so <coughs> lost control over their sovereignty that there's basically no point in expressing themselves anymore uh, through votes. Um, there's also this generalized feeling in Europe that uh, policies have to be made by technocrats and that they have to be made within strict constraints anyway. So voters really could have stayed home. And despite all of that, they did turn out massively in the first round, and they showed no sign of campaign fatigue. <coughs> um, so probably I would guess that this lesson um, is not very portable to the US case. Um, I mean, especially to the US, where less is expected from the president. I mean, in France, we still expect everything. <coughs> the president himself, I mean, that past president, has, has tried to convey that he was on top of everything, and he was doing everything. Um, so you know, in, for that reason, voters tend to go and, and, um, and cast their ballots more. Um, and also in the US, I think it's not portable either because it seems that the country is almost constantly in campaign mode. Um, that election with the primaries, this lasts for so long and the terms are shorter. In France, we only have one presidential election, one legislative election every five years. And the campaign itself, the, the timeline of the campaign is much more um, uh, shortened, it's, it's uh, much compressed. So I think that's not necessarily a lesson that, that can apply. But that was a, an interesting uh, uh, surprise for French politics. The second lesson, and this one of course will surprise no one, um, is that it's very difficult to be an incumbent in today's hard economic climate. Um, all the re recent elections in Europe have demonstrated that. Um, Sarkozy got 27% of about 27% of the votes and, and second place finish behind Hollande in the first round. That was clearly a vote of no confidence. I mean, even though the margin is small, it was interpreted as a vote of no confidence to the president. Sitting presidents don't come second in the first round of French presidential elections. Um, so to be sure, the anti-Sarkozy vote was not only an anti-incumbent vote, it was also an anti-Sarkozy uh, vote. The, as we said before, you know, the, the 
personal behavior, the personal <laughs> demeanor uh, of Sarkozy over the years really started to break the French the wrong way. Um, so a vote against Sarkozy was as much a vote against the man as it was a vote against the function of somebody who was sitting in office. But personally, you know, withstanding, it's, it's really not easy being an incumbent today in the current times of economic crisis in Europe. And all around France, you know, Greece to the Netherlands, Italy, uh, everywhere, incumbents are being dethroned. Uh, so why should Sarkozy's fate be different? And I think that's a lesson that probably can travel in the American context, that in order to win an incumbent, and it's much harder for an incumbent this year than it is usually, um, and in order to win, the incumbent really needs a combination of an opponent who's really weak, a rapidly improving economic outlook, and some kind of an um, event that serves as a deus ex machina that, that just arrived there in the middle of the campaign or just before, uh, before the campaign and enables the country to come together as well. So that was my second lesson. Uh, third lesson is that, um, and I think that one's pretty portable too, um, it's not foreign policy stupid. We, we know it's not a bad foreign policy. Um, a year ago, about a year ago, it seemed that Sarkozy had tried to refocus his energy solely on foreign policy and leave the domestic issues to his prime minister, which is the way it's almost always done in France. You, know, you, you leave the, the sale de boulot, the dirty job of domestic reforms and all of that to your prime minister and the president uh, deals with this reserved domain of foreign policy, the higher spheres of French grandeur, uh, etc. And, and Sarkozy tried to do that shift, operate that shift about a year ago with the election in sight. But it, it simply it seems he couldn't help himself of being the hyperactive uh, president that, that he is and meddling everything. Uh, so if he had stuck to his plan and stuck only to foreign policy, could this have been a winning strategy? Um, he could have capitalized on what he had cast his campaign narrative um, to be as, as foreign policy successes. Um, he was, and then as a result, France was basically on all fronts for the past five years. You know, from Georgia to Libya, from the institutional crisis in the EU to the crisis of the euro in the EU, from NATO to the G20, everywhere you have this hyperactive and ubiquitous foreign policy which puts France back at the center of the action. Um, Sarkozy has taken a lot of leads, a lot of initiatives, some which have been more um, efficient or uh, uh, successful than others, and some that had more follow-up than others, because that's a problem. You know, we touch a lot of things and very often uh, nothing followed. Um, so after all, you know, we know that the French care about their stature, they care about the role of France in the world, more so than other people. So should they not have rewarded Sarkozy at the polls for that? Uh, why hasn't his strategy been more successful? Well, first of all, one reason for that disaffection with foreign policy may be that um, what may have passed for foreign policy successes initially simply was forgotten by the time of the elections. Uh, voters have very short memories. Who remembers today the Bulgarian nurses that uh, Sarkozy, actually that Cecilia Sarkozy, Sarkozy's former wife, triumphantly returned uh, from Libya uh, in the first few months of, of office in 2007? Which French voter today remembers how Sarkozy handled the Georgia crisis in 2008? Uh, who remembers Ygritte Betancourt, who was this French hostage who was freed from the FARC guerrillas in Colombia in 2008? Actually, the only thing they know is that we have another hostage uh, that was just taken um, this week. Um, who remembers even that Sarkozy was one of the main instigators of the G20 uh, in 2008? So that's the first reason that people don't simply have short memories. Another reason may be that what may have passed for foreign policy successes initially then became subject to a different interpretation as time went by. So you take Libya, for instance, um, which seems to be like the poster child of Sarkozy's foreign policy success. Um, he may have been sitting on cloud nine at the time of the intervention uh, in, in last year, when you had French flags being flown all over Benghazi. But you fast forward until now, and is it that clear today in the current campaign that that operation was a success after all? Um, the domestic judgments about the outcome have shifted. The support and pride in France's return to the center of the action 
a few months ago have waned. And instead you have um, more and more French analysts and apparently more and more French voters who are questioning whether it was all worth it and whether the change and instability that it brought about was not ultimately for the worse. Um, and so in the current campaign, it's even turning um, against Sarkozy with uh, rumors that, that this is what several of us already alluded to, but you may not be aware, but rumors that Gaddafi may have actually secretly supported Sarkozy's electoral campaign in 2007. So we don't know whether that's true or not. This is, you know, this may be a hoax. Sarkozy is already suing the outlet Mediapart that Angèle referred to. He's vehemently denying, he's saying this is not true. Uh, but it's hard to count Libya today as a plus when Sarkozy tries to appeal to the public, which is why he doesn't talk about it. And the same story can be told about the euro crisis. For months you had Sarkozy who tried to cast himself as half of the tandem that saved the euro. You saw that, that picture with, with Merkel uh, right there. And he is the one who drafted that miraculous Mercosy pact, mm -hmm. came to be known as the Mercosy pact. Um, he tried to argue his case during the campaign uh, before the first round to the French public by claiming that if Hollande were elected, the pact would be renegotiated and Europe would fall into, descend into chaos. And for a while, actually, that seemed to be one of Sarkozy's strongest arguments. Um, but the narrative has changed very recently, uh, even after, it has changed after the first round, as a serious academics, serious policymakers in Europe and elsewhere, you know, even at Princeton, uh, started to question the wisdom of the arrangement of the first place, the wisdom of promoting austerity over growth. So it's, you know, it's hard for him to capitalize on what used to be seen as a success before because it's not seen as a success anymore. Um, but the true reason for Sarkozy's inability to capitalize more on foreign policy is that, as, as we already knew, uh, foreign policy does not pay in domestic politics. That's this third essential les lesson. That's not a novel lesson. In the end, voters always cast their ballots on economic and social issues. They don't cast their ballots on foreign policy <coughs> ones. Um, so that was the third. And finally, the last lesson, I think in the end, the real lesson of this election, is that the real cleavage that matters in French politics today, it's not an ideolo ideological cleavage anymore between left and right, but it's really an economic cleavage. Um, and the usual prism through which to read French politics no longer applies. Um, if you, you know, if you tally up the votes in the first round, you, you, you know, you're not exactly sure where France stands. France is more to the right, and yet it might elect a candidate of the left. No, we, we don't really understand. They got 29, this one got 27, this one got 18, this one got 11. You know, what, what's going on? If you only try to read that through a left-right prism, we don't get what's going on. Um, the first round really highlighted the cleavage centered around openness and closure. And that appeared very clearly um, in the ads that we saw today. On one hand, you know, before the first round, because it's changing this tune, but on one hand, you know, Sarkozy, Hollande, and François Bérou, the centrist candidate who got 9%, they all believe that France is a country that benefits from openness, that benefits from globalization, even if these come at a price, and that it is destined to pursue the adventure of European integration. Of course, none of them can say that loudly uh, because that's France. And as I've argued myself in my previous work, you know, France is in total and has been for a long time in total globalization denial. But still, they, that's, that's what they truly believe. And on the other hand, you have Marine Le Pen's National Front and Jean-Luc Mélenchon from gauche and, and the cacophony of small candidates from the far left to the sovereignist right who represent what we've called la France du nom, the France that said no uh, that turned down the European Constitution in 2005. And these people believe that the key to the future is really about <coughs> reasserting sovereignty. Um, it's about a third of the voters in the first round. And they feel that they've lost their country. They feel that they've lost their destiny. For them, France has been taken over. This is what David was, was saying. Uh, it's been taken over by immigrants at home. It's been taken over by Eurocrats in Brussels. It's been taken over by Technocrats in international institutions has been taken over by global financial markets. It's not their friends anymore, and they really want to send um, a message. So, seen in this light, you know, it's, it's not about left versus right, but it's really about where you stand on globalization, whether you want to be in or whether you want to be out. Um, then you can explain the score of Marie Le Pen um, a little bit more easily. And I'm not trying to exculpate the French for racism or say, you know, these 18%, it's not that they're racist. Uh, 
to be sure, Marine Le Pen leads a party that is really united by this nationalistic anti-immigrant stance. And the fear and the scapegoating of the other, especially if that other has a you know, North African uh, face or is of Muslim origin, um, that runs deep among the fraction of the electorate that she represents. And the massacre in, in Toulouse and, and uh, Montauban uh, certainly served as this focal point for anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim anxieties in the campaign and really helped her electoral results. But I think that the call to halt immigration and give France back to the French is only one part of her platform. And she has been actually much more successful than her father in trying to broaden the platform of the National Front. That's something that Jean-Marie Le Pen tried to do in 2002, the year he was successful. That's the year where he tried to also take this anti-globalization stance and not only this anti-immigrant stance. Um, but really, she's trying to focus her campaign on how to subtract France from outside pressures and outside constraints. She's railing as much against Europe, against ultra-liberalism, and against global markets than she is against immigrants. And indeed, if you look at the sociology of her voters, you know, sometimes young voters who have fewer chances at, at, uh, at doing as well as their parents did, or working class people, retired people, it really resembles the sociology of the Tea Party in the United States. So the themes are different. I'm not saying that the policy prescriptions are similar. They're very different. You know, this is France after all. They believe in the central role of government. They don't want to keep the government out. They want more government. Uh, but but except for that, it really is the same type of, of voters. If you look at electoral geography, it seems that Marine Le Pen has advanced over her father in a number of areas, but especially, there was a fantastic map, I don't know who saw it, in Le Monde, uh, about the Le Pen vote, and you could see that the vote was always at the periphery. Mm -hmm. uh, it had this big bubble, so it was at the periphery of the cities, it was at the periphery of the smaller cities, um, it's really a peri-urban working class belt around big towns and small towns in rural regions, uh, including in the west and the southwest, where the, FN, the Front National before did not really have a foothold. And I think it's the French equivalent of the Rust Belt, uh, where you have decaying small enterprises um, in industry where France is losing to low-wage competition. Sometimes it's in places where you have only one factory, and then that factory closes. Um, so that's the type of voters that she has attracted this time. It's not only about immigrants, it's really about, well, they've not been on the winning end of globalization. So if you read the election through this openness versus closure prism, then the election starts to make uh, more sense. And I think that's probably the broader, more applicable lesson for other countries who are watching the French election right now. That the world is experiencing these momentous uh, political and economic shifts and you have publics in Western democracies who are going through an existential crisis. And whether they want to be in or they want to be out of these global flows of goods, people, ideas, etc., is what separates them from one another. So as a result of all of that, um, the electoral contest in France in the second round cannot play out in the global economic sphere. And this is exactly what's happening. You know, notice that none of these two candidates in their ads mention, you know, uh, what they were going to do. Uh, this is not where the, um, the campaign can be. Because there is no, I mean, maybe Ezra will disagree, but I imagine probably not. There is no real fundamental difference um, between the international economic vision of Hollande and of Sarkozy, even if there is a difference on domestic matters, uh, such as fiscal policy or growth versus austerity, but not the broader uh, scheme of things. They both understand that globalization imposes these constraints on policy, but that France needs to stay in. But they cannot say it. So you know, they, they are going to continue to do globalization by stealth, which is what they've all done before, whether left or right. And the election is playing out elsewhere. <coughs> it's playing out in questions of style, in questions of personality, on little social issues, like you know, what's happening with halal meat uh, you know, in, in France and in discussions about European governance, European austerity. So to, to finish, I'll just say that Sarkozy is really facing an uphill battle um, on Sunday, uh, again, Saturday here. Um, in order to win, he really has to straddle the pro-European centrist on his left, the 9% that voted for Beru, the 18% on his right uh, who voted for the National Front. And clearly we saw in the ad that he's chosen um, which direction to go to. 
But it's also tricky for him because of the incoherence of the message and the actions that he has projected um, over the past five years. On the one hand, you have this very activist foreign policy, as well as this constant presence on the European scene during the, his first five years in office. And through that, he tried to conjure up the, the image of a country um, that still has a very loud voice in the world, a country that's still in the center of things, uh, that can still decide its own fate. That's what he has shown through his actions. <laughs> and that's a pretty tough act to reconcile with this collectively accepted narrative uh, that this is a country which has been victimized by globalization, which has lost all margin of maneuver, uh, especially because the EU is not the buffer that it had been promised to be, um, but rather it's kind of a Trojan horse of the worst effects of globalization into France. So it's hard for him to do both at the same time. Who are the French to believe? Are they going to be the Sarkozy, believe the Sarkozy wants to be elected because he has been present on all these major European international fronts? You know, the one where you see the picture with Merkel and, and Obama? Uh, or are they going to elect the Sarkozy who tells them that um, there's basically nothing that they can do except protect um, and defend and that it's not his fault because he's powerless in the face of these global constraints and that France you know, maybe has to brace itself because it might be the next one in line for the next sovereign debt crisis. Um, so that's really why it's very, very difficult for him. You know, all the rest notwithstanding, it's very difficult um, for that. And now that the US, I mean, this is an issue we haven't talked about uh, much, you know, the US, but the US is basically no longer on, on the radar. <laughs> it's not very important anymore um, for France. It's not, no longer seen as the suspect for all the woes that France is facing, the blame has to be placed elsewhere. So it's being placed on you know, global financial markets, it's being placed on the Germans, uh, it's being placed on with all the exploited Chinese. Um, and this election is really about making sense of a threat which we haven't seen before, before we knew where the threat was coming from. This time, it's really not clear. It's a threat that's more diffuse, that's confused, that's exotic. Um, and so France is really experiencing this, as always, I mean, it's not new, but France is, again, experiencing a new existential crisis. <laughs> Just a, one quick uh, correction for the historical record. Uh, I don't think it was Obama who made that joke, uh, uh, Sarkozy, <laughs> who made the joke about uh, Obama being tanned. It was Berlusconi. Uh, no, 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 he said Jay Bruni. I have Carlo Bruni. Oh oh, 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 I see, I see. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Where is going to prompt it? Right, 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 actually it was, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, uh, uh, you, you, you can never catch David uh, on any historical, even a recent historical fact. But I misunderstood the Rooney part. Uh, it's always difficult when you are the last person to speak because everybody has essentially said most of the things, and um, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, you know, the classic way of looking at, at uh, a campaign in France, or really even at French politics, it reminds me of a very famous uh, political scientist historian wrote many years ago that in France you have two parties, and if you want to understand French history, you have to understand that there is a party of movement, there is a party of order. That is a conservative, a left, and a right, and so on. And that's the key to understanding uh, 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 French history and French politics. And I think there is a kind of a, uh, an interest in preserving this kind of image. And every campaign uh, tries actually uh, to do that. Uh, 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 François Hollande gave the tone to his campaign in that very first huge meeting at the Villepinte when he said, you know, there is my enemy, I, he doesn't have a name, he doesn't have a face. Uh, um, uh, he doesn't have really thoughts, uh, you can't uh, pin him down, and that's finance, that's my enemy. And, uh, 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 and some on the, on the right uh, tried, tried mildly to confuse the left of the left, that is the extreme left, uh, with, the, with the Socialist Party, 
uh, but the left has many faces, as does the right. Uh, and so it uh, uh, was really to the advantage of uh, the right to try to paint the left in that way, and it was in, to the advantage of Hollande to clearly stake a position on the left where, obviously, he took he, this from the page of, uh, of uh, uh, Mitterrand, who basically, whose policy was unite the left and then uh, you'll win because there are more uh, left people in France than there are right-wing people and so on. And if somehow you can kind of do this magic uh, by bringing them all together in some way or other, then you will win the election. And every single socialist who has tried to be president has tried basically uh, to do that uh, since then. Uh, and that's why sometimes a candidate is bound to sound a little uh, 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 extreme because he has to try to capture, uh, after all, what was a very substantial vote, uh, uh, 11 point something percent and so on. So in a way though, both parties have an interest uh, in calling up old images associated with the left and the right. I mean, uh, the left you heard throughout <coughs> the campaign, the names of Jaurès or Bloom that kept cr uh, cropping up, the re sort of the rhetoric of, of, of struggle, and certainly Mélenchon, the, left, the more leftist candidate, uh, did that. You hear uh, 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 historical uh, uh, um, episodes, whether it's uh, Dreyfus, whether it's the Commune, uh, whether it's the Congé Payé, uh, harking back to uh, the, the Popular Front was mentioned very, very often uh, in the course of the campaign. And on the right, you have all kinds of uh, uh, models. You have Jean d'Arc for, uh, for uh, uh, Mrs. Le Pen, and you have uh, de Gaulle for essentially uh, uh, the right, the center right. Um, and I, I, the question then is, is this a reflection, any kind of accurate reflection of French politics uh, uh, today? Uh, or is it an attempt to uh, live up to an image which is also actually very advantageous for the two political, major political parties and allows them to remain as the dominant political parties, one claiming to be on the left, one claiming to be uh, on the right. And I think there may be something else going on. Because if you look at actually what takes place, that is not the le this level of uh, high rhetoric and so on, because it's mostly rhetoric is what it is. It doesn't really tell you what is actually going on. So that if you actually look at public policies, I think you see something else going on. Uh, uh, and one I think is immediately struck by a kind of consensus. One might hesitate to use this word in France because certainly the two parties would hate it. Uh, but nonetheless, if you actually look at public policies, if you look at where disagreements are in the political uh, spectrum, uh, you actually have a fairly hard time trying to uh, pinpoint them. Uh, the political divergences between the two parties uh, look more like perfect harmony, by the way, when compared to our political system. So how is that possible? Uh, if Tocqueville were to come back today, he would be absolutely stunned. Uh, he would say, my God, these two countries have changed places because uh, he admired America for the pragmatism, uh, the compromise, uh, which was a very, very positive word, used to be in America, uh, and, and Tocqueville liked that, whereas it was always a pejorative term uh, in the French uh, lexicon. Uh, and yet we seem to have uh, changed places. That is, in a sense, that uh, the country that he admired uh, with its ability to reach ag agreements, you know, by sort of um, uh, splitting the poire uh, in half, or how do you say that in, uh, <laughs> in the cake, in, or whatever, uh, 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 has been, so to speak, Europeanized, whereas uh, France has actually been Americanized in some sense. Uh, 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 it has become, I mean, when you really look at it and you look at the pu public policies, it has become essentially a social democratic uh, 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 country. And both parties, in a way, certainly if they don't espouse it, they certainly follow social democratic uh, 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 policies. Uh, uh, and the right certainly has absorbed uh, it. Which explains why uh, Marine Le Pen uh, says that they're, this, they're the same for her. Uh, and that uh, that's why she's not going to vote for one or uh, the other. 
Uh, they're both for the welfare state, for the environment, uh, for security, uh, for all of those things that you heard that the, uh, just before that uh, Sophie put up, that the uh, supporters of Hollande were saying, you, they could easily be said, you could find any number of people who would say exactly, I'm for the environment, I'm for security, I'm for this and that, etc., etc. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, So as far as domestic policy is concerned, there is actually very little separation and very little disagreement. Everything is puffed up and played up and so on and so forth and exaggerated, but that is part of politics, it is part of campaigning, it is part of maintaining your position and it's part of preserving your electorate. Secondly, I would say that both uh, 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 have basically the same policy towards Europe uh, and both have a faction that is totally opposed to uh, Europe. And this also has come out. Mélenchon voted against the uh, a treaty. Uh, Marine Le Pen obviously despises the, uh, Europe and despises the treaty for many of the reasons that Sophie said. Um, they left for uh, slightly other reasons. But nonetheless, uh, uh, they both despise uh, Europe. Um, so there are maybe more, I would say, on the left, more uh, doubters. But on the whole, uh, Hollande is a very pro-Europe Europe guy. He worked with Jacques Delors and so on and so forth. And thirdly, I would say that the consensus uh, has always existed uh, between them on the sort of general parameters of foreign policy. Not that foreign policy, as Sophie said, played a role at all in, the, in this campaign. Nobody cared that... Um, uh, Sarkozy went to Libya uh, and joined American forces and so on and so forth there and ousted Gaddafi, etc. I mean, nobody cares about that uh, at all in France. I don't think it got him one vote. I would say the left is possibly uh, less Atlanticist th than the right on, on the whole, on the whole, although the right has been very, very anti-American uh, 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 at certain periods of recent history. Um, and I think uh, if you really followed the campaign, you will have noted that uh, there were very uh, few issues. In fact, there was a, an attempt to obviate the issues uh, that might actually come up and show that there were less uh, divergent, uh, less, uh, there were fewer differences uh, 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 amongst them. Um, so what did they disagree on? I mean, if you look at some of the things, I mean, I was absolutely stunned. There were as at least, it, it was worth three days of debate. It was worth nothing, but it was, I mean, it took three days discussing um, whether uh, uh, licenses, uh, driving licenses uh, uh, should be cheaper and should be delivered more quickly. Uh, whether uh, uh, the, all the meals at schools for the children should be the same everywhere and so on, and everybody should have to eat uh, uh, that food, that concerned the halal uh, uh, con controversy and so on. Something just kind of made up like this, like uh, uh, contraception in the United States, which suddenly becomes an issue and nobody understands exactly why. Uh, now, uh, 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 there's been very little discussion of the critical issues that affect domestic policy or foreign policy, uh, both parties took a fairly, I mean, even though they are led by Europeanists, Europeans, pro-Europeans, pro-Europe, in fact, towards the end, Sarkozy started to, because he wanted to uh, attract and, uh, and siphon off some of the Le Pen vo uh, voters, uh, started basically to uh, backpedal uh, somewhat. Uh, Hollande, uh, uh, had his anti-Germany moment and uh, uh, said that he was going to go and confront uh, Mrs. Merkel as soon as he's elected and so on and so forth. Uh, and so both in a way had a tendency, I think, to satisfy their constituencies in a sense, uh, to side with some protectionism, uh, controlling immigration, and so on and so forth. Many of the things that they associate with losing control, again, as Sophie was mentioning about globalization, the fear it induces, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, if you want to take another example, uh, Sarkozy had, at the beginning of his term, 
said one of the things that he absolutely intends to do is to do something about these elite uh, uh, schools that exist in France and they train all the people around him, not him, but all the people around him. Uh, and um, uh, we will start, he said, by ending the, um, the rankings in, in the schools and so on and so forth. Well, you didn't hear anything about it until about six months ago, he suddenly <laughs> pops it up again and nobody quite understands why. And the people who came down hardest on him were uh, people on the left. Uh, and it was absolutely uh, uh, astonishing uh, to see that. He's talking basically about social mobility and so on. And the left says, no, no, we are not going to touch these schools. We're not going to touch the rankings and so on. The point is there's not, nothing wrong with the rankings. There are rankings everywhere. I don't know. There are rankings in Princeton. I'm sure there are. But uh, uh, the point is that the rankings in France have a very significant uh, uh, result for the rest of your life. That is, if you're ranked at the top, I your professional career is determined by that rank. So in France, it's extremely important, and uh, whereas it is less, it doesn't determine uh, whether you graduate first or, or second or, or uh, 350th uh, in most other uh, places. Now, the question becomes, why does this kind of consensus that, that I'm talking about uh, occur, and what are some of its implications? Uh, no one would argue, I think, that the parties or the voters or the citizens uh, should be at each other's throat as they are in the United States. Uh, that doesn't make any sense just to have uh, differences of opinion. Um, uh, nor, I think, does anyone really uh, uh, believe that an immobilized or polarized society is better than a consensual one. Uh, that's not the point. Uh, the French, in my view, have the luxury of pretending to be uh, uh, more, di more polarized uh, than they actually are. Uh, they have to kind of conjure it up. They have to use very heavy rhetoric in order to show that they are, uh, and that is a kind of luxury. In America, we don't have that luxury because they are really, people are really have very different philosophies on how the society should be governed, uh, on the dis distribution of wealth, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, these are fundamental differences, what the state should do and so on and so forth. Uh, they are not conjured up at all, which makes them obviously a lot more uh, uh, dangerous, even if it makes them more meaningful. Um, most voters know that some things will change, but I think that uh, they know that neither party that gets into power will totally transform I mean, uh, Hollande's uh, um, uh, book, actually, that he wrote was entitled Changer le Destin. I mean, this is something that harks back to the end of capitalism, Mitterrand's uh, uh, thing, and so on and so forth. Uh, Changer le Destin, I mean, they, he could very well regret it in five years if, if, if he gets in to say that he was going to Changer le Destin. They'll just point it to him and say, you said you were going to change our destiny, you didn't change maybe anything, who knows, we'll see. Uh, uh, so um, I think it's quite an achievement though to have citizens who always feared that their life would be turned upside down whether one party won or the other party won and so on and so forth. But I think this does come at a cost, uh, which is uh, that public policy operates and is seen within certain very well-defined parameters parameters that are generally acceptable, even if not uh, uh, avowed. Uh, and important changes become almost scarcely uh, uh, conceivable, I I'm through. Um, now, uh, I was going to uh, ask the question, but I won't because we're running out of time, which is what can one expect of a Hollande uh, presidency? But I will stop and maybe in one of the questions, I, I, I don't want to take any more time since you pointed it. <laughs> I always follow orders. <laughs> 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 so, other older questions before we do, and we need to end really at six before I do. So, um, I'll have to remind everybody that there's a reception that's going to follow um, there. And then I forgot to mention that this was also co sponsored by LAPA, who also spoke you for one and several French texts. Let's gather a couple of questions and we'll. Answering one minute at the end. Uh, yes. 
Um, so bouncing off something that Mademoiselle Pistin said, um, so you mentioned that uh, François Hollande has the most number of followers on Twitter, which is approximately 260,000 people, and Obama has uh, roughly 15 million. And so I was wondering if you thought that the discrepancy between those two numbers say anything, say something, if anything, um, about the level of motivation and implication of political life of American voter population versus that of the French. And the, it's bouncing off something you said, but it's open to everyone. Um, yeah, this is really fascinating, and I'm having trouble putting together all the different views. And so one way to think about it, if Ezra's right, that, that in fact there's a big chunk of stuff that won't change in an election that really isn't even argued about, um, then I wonder if this explains part of what uh, Angel was finding, which is that there's this drive toward personality um, in the coverage of the election, and that this, these are the stories that are getting all this attention. And so then I wonder if this makes sense of the turnout. I mean, so are, how much, are, how much is, is this really a people either love or really hate Sarkozy by now. Um, and how much of this is that, you know, Hollande is not uh, DSK, but at least he's not in trouble. Um, and so how much of this is really personality and not policy, I guess, in the, you, you were focusing on policy, but I'm not sure that's what's going on. Yeah. What's going to happen? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm oh, so you want me? I'm asking you. I was uh, sparing okay. you. No, wait, 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 wait. Okay. questions. And then you get to us. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Sophie, five years ago, you invited a professor to come and talk about Sarko and what it was going to be like and what he, his uh, uh, virtues were and <coughs> his deficits were. Um, Looking back five years, what has he done and what hasn't he done? Yes. Don't, don't you think that the many uninteresting uh, facts such as alal meat and driving license on the media are the results of like the media consequences of every that the need of being uh, on the spotlight all the time for the media and getting most of the coverage. The second one is that, don't you think that the French people, this is also the reflect that the French people are afraid of what's going to happen in the next five years and don't want to talk about important matters <laughs> such as the debt crisis, which clearly is a big problem. Um, my s another question is, don't you think that Hollande, uh, do you think that Hollande have already won the race, it's over, and, um, and yeah. <laughs> well, it's a long question, so we'll take them as your way, which is right. Well, I, I, maybe I can combine a couple of, yes. uh, 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 of the answers. As far as uh, personality, and I'm really glad you brought it up, because uh, uh, you, there is, because Sarkozy, <coughs> what Sarkozy did basically, he fell short more on presentation, if I can put it that way. I mean, like the thing that uh, David mentioned of what he said, you know, a president doesn't talk that, uh, sort of in, in, in terms of form and so on. And uh, then there was all this business about how he celebrated when he won five years ago in this big fancy restaurant and how the next day he was on the yacht and so on. You know, usually if you're a president, you observe the, the forms and uh, mores of the Republic, uh, you go to some cemetery, uh, some tomb, you know. Uh, uh, solemn, something solemn. Uh, or you go with Mitterrand down in the Pantheon, you know, and so on. And, and those, you know, are very, he didn't observe any of that. Uh, and then he spoke in the way that David mentioned, you know, so on, just to somebody on the street, I mean, and so on and so forth. And I think there has developed, uh, plus he was very aggressive, uh, impolite to people and so on and so forth, people in his own party, I mean, you know, and so on. And so I think they developed very quickly, and it never changed, a kind of visceral rejection of this guy. So that people were no longer looking at what he was actually trying to do, and so on. It wasn't always consistent and coherent, but he did try to do certain things. Uh, I mean, he raised the uh, 
uh, the retirement age. Okay, very modestly, but anything, even to raise it by a day, would have caused people <laughs> to go onto the streets. You raised it by two years. I was surprised. I thought you should have raised it by five, and the same people would have been on the street anyway. So uh, he would have at least have gotten a really major reform through, some reform that absolutely has to be done at some point. Uh, and maybe Hollande will do it. So I think that what you're absolutely right. I mean, there, was, there really was a visceral uh, a, a hatred of this guy. And the, uh, he could have been the last man standing in France and nobody would have voted for him. And so uh, 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 I was a bit surprised. I mean, it's a bit exaggerated as a reaction, to be honest with you. When you think of some of the things Mitterrand did and so on, I mean, you know, or other presidents have done, uh, it's a bit, uh, you know, uh, maybe possibly a bit excessive, but he did inspire this kind of thing. And, uh, and there isn't any question. So I do think that personalities have played a role. As far as Hollande is concerned, his, he has always been presented as uh, a kind of, you know, a soft, uh, uh, Martin Aubry called him uh, flambe, which is a, a kind of a flan, you know, wobbly uh, 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 flan. And, um, but I think that we will find out that there is uh, uh, no politician today where the public persona and the way in which he is perceived and who, how he actually behaves. He is much more of an actual killer than Sarkozy. Sarkozy did not, wasn't a killer. He just, you know, he'd scream and he'd, you know, and so on. But in actual behavior, he was, he is actually a very, very decisive person. And I have a, a sneaking suspicion that he reminds me a bit of Eisenhower because Eisenhower was always accused Ah, vacations, golf, this, that, the other. And in fact, we have learned from the histories that have been published over the last 20 years that this guy was really controlling everything and so on. And maybe, I, I mean, maybe an exaggeration to compare him, but there is definitely something. He must have played that image up, um, uh, Hollande, over the years and certainly over the campaign. I mean, it suited him. It actually suited him and um, contrasted so strongly with Sarkozy, uh, with that aggressive person, he said at the very beginning, I will, Hollande, I will be a normal president. People laughed, what's normal, what's abnormal, you know, this kind of thing, questions. But he meant something very specific, which is I'm not gonna be like Sarkozy, I'm not go going to be frenetic, I'm not going to try to control everything, I'm not gonna run around, I'm just gonna be a normal guy like you and me and so on, you know, that kind of thing. And I think, you know, this may be his weapon, uh, uh, you see. And so I think what he might do, I mean, everybody thinks what he will do is, he will do what any socialist president, to show that uh, there is a break with the immediate predecessor. And so they open the tap and the money starts flying out of the window, except there is no money to fly out of the window <laughs> this time. That's very, very different. So uh, my guess is he will do some of that, uh, increase uh, uh, the number of civil servants uh, modestly and so on and so forth, which is I think why I was going to talk about this, but there's no time, why he has now called for pro-growth policy. It's the only way for him to get his hands on some money uh, right away in order to uh, stimulate consumption. But he has no policy for actually, uh, it certainly hasn't announced it, uh, for economic growth and increasing France's competitiveness. That's what one would have liked to, to hear with this pro-growth uh, uh, policy. So, but I do think that he will probably, I'm just guessing, some report will come out, and there have been already a couple, uh, and he will say, oh my God, the situation is so much worse than I thought. Uh, and so he will, if he is really a, a smart politician, he will be able to convince uh, uh, the trade unions and the others, basically, in his own party, to go along, and that it is not an austerity measure, but it's something that we have to do because they left us such a bag to hold, you see? So I, it may be, but I may be too optimistic. Uh. <laughs> we, we all need to go very soon. David, do you want to have a last word here? Well, I just want to say something very, very quickly. I mean, I, I think this has been actually a great panel because actually I think these papers have fit together really well. I think Ezra's put his finger on it with the fact that, you know, that between the major parties, there's very little daylight right now. There's very little 
room to maneuver. And yet, as Sophie says, there are real issues, there are real divisions, except the divisions have not been able to express themselves in the major parties. It has led to the kind of personality campaign, the lack of involvement, and, and such that Angel was talking about. But will this remain the case? Or if one of the, if one of the major parties does start to crumble, could the could the real politics, in a sense, that Sophie is talking about over these issues of Europe, could, could these come to the fore? I think that's going to be the real drama in French politics, possibly over the next few years, to see if a new real divide comes in, through, you know, with and puts the socialists and the UMP on the same side against against the, against the, against the, the, against the real. Break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. We'll continue the conversation outside because several of us have to leave. But thank you.